You know, with the publication this year of the first Japanese fantasy novel in the Twelve Kingdoms series in English, and with the first World Science Fiction Convention being held in Yokohama, Japan, it just seemed appropriate, since Roland Kelts was kind enough to stop by, to sit down and talk about the effect of the Japanese culture and the way it has come to color and infuse the American culture. So, Roland, welcome to Fast Forward. Thank you for stopping by. Uh, thanks for having me. You know, it's a fascinating book, Japan America, How Japanese Pop Culture Has Invaded the U.S. And in the book, it's not just Japanese culture invading the U.S. You also discuss the elements of American culture and their impact on Japanese culture post-war. But let's start off with why you wrote this book. Give us a little bit about how you came to decide this was a subject that needed writing about. Well, it's a somewhat complicated story. My um, publisher actually asked me if I would consider exploring this. Always uh, a good sign. Yeah, a good sign. <laughs> I, um, I had, I've, I've written a number of articles about uh, Japanese culture, contemporary Japanese culture, uh, novelists in Japan. Mm -hmm. I've also written fiction that takes place in Japan. So they asked me if I can, I'd consider exploring this world. And I think the reason I took to it was that I couldn't find any other books uh, that told the story of how these two cultures have become intertwined. And I also couldn't find another book um, <clears throat> that would reach out to a general reader, not just fans. Well, and, uh, and, and uh, you'd, although we do talk a lot about manga and anime, which are the things people know about, mm -hmm. we talk, you, you also examined fashion. Right, and you've examined a lot of the a lot of the business model and a lot of the cultural approaches the Japanese have, and how it has influenced the way that media has moved from Japan to the U.S. I, and and there are two terms that you use, and you're going to have to correct my pronunciation. Tateme, uh, tatemai, tatemai, and hone, hone, yeah. And could you explain what those <coughs> two mean, because they're very central to the examination you make. Well, as with most Japanese terms, there are sort of various nuances, but to put it into shorthand, tatemaya is uh, your public self, the way you behave during the day, the way you behave uh, at your office with your superiors and your subordinates, uh, the way you behave on the streets with strangers uh, on the train. <clears throat> uh, hone is your private realm, your private self, uh, how you really feel, perhaps. Uh, it's the difference between a uh, Japanese businessman when he's at work, uh, bowing, handing over his business card, and when he's at the bar or restaurant after work. Three beers into the evening. Yeah, three, or, three or more, <laughs> yeah. And it's a vast, vast difference. <laughs> and, and you also discuss one other thing, how the trauma of Hiroshima and Nagasaki the impact it had on Japanese literature, on, mm. on Japanese art, on the, the Japanese culture as a whole, and how it reinforced the feeling Japan has of being small and isolated and kind of trapped between many powerful neighbors, and tied it to our reaction since 2001 of the 9-11 tragedy, and I found that fascinating. Yeah, and it's uh, certainly a theory that took me out on a limb. Um, I, I, think, I think it has some validity. Mm. It is something that I explored principally after I received an email from my mother. <clears throat> it was uh, in the very hours after the first plane struck the Twin Towers. And my mother was heading home from, from her office in Boston. And uh, I couldn't get through on the phone. I was in Tokyo. I just landed in Tokyo. I was watching this happening on television and uh, finally got an email from my mother. And the first line was, uh, this is war. You know, Roland, this is war. And the second line really startled me. And she wrote, um, I never thought I'd feel this way again, not in America. Oh, wow. And the reason that kind of uh, knocked me out was because I realized her reference was to her experiences in, in Japan, uh, specifically in Tokyo, during the firebombing. Right. When she was underground with her family uh, in the bomb shelters and eventually escaped uh, to northern Japan. And, and a lot of Americans don't understand the impact that had on Japan, the almost total destruction of the infrastructure through the bombings, the fire bombings, more than the, the two atomic bombs being dropped, and the devastation it brought on the country and on its industrial base. I mean, the things that 
in the end set the stage for the industrial rebirth of the country, but still absolutely horrible and a terrible toll on the populace. That's right. I mean, in addition to the, the obvious, like, as you said, the decimation of the, the infrastructure, it's also the humiliation of the emperor, you know, who was forced to concede defeat over the radio. This high and mighty figure who was seen as divine was suddenly not only no longer divine, but was had his face thrust into the dirt. So it was uh, about as traumatic an event as a nation can undergo, which is not to ignore the fact that Japan had also inflicted horrible atrocities onto their Asian neighbors. Um, but it's interesting you put it that way. I hadn't really thought of it in those terms, the death of a god, mm -hmm. which makes an underlying theme of a lot of Japanese storytelling in the post-war era, the conflict of gods and, and, and ordinary people and the death of gods or semi-omnipotent uh, beings an underlying theme in a lot of the storytelling in post-war right. Japan. Also, the, the, the uh, idea of so many characters in anime and so many characters in the original manga being uh, what, what we might consider gray figures, having some virtues and having some sometimes uh, devastating flaws, never being quite you know, the single-minded or um, moral paragon that we tended to come to expect from American uh, comics. Uh, you don't get this. You don't think of Japanese characters in anime as superheroes. And yet, it was that aspect in the early days when the first anime, when uh, when when uh, the the first anime was brought over from Japan to the U.S. It was that ambiguity yeah. that was obliterated in order to make it palatable to American audiences. Well, I wouldn't say obliterated. <laughs> but masked. They tried to mask it. Yeah, <clears throat> and that was you know I, I, there's. They were just responding to demographics. They were responding to network affiliates. I think if we, that's one of the stories I tell in the book, which is the, the story of, uh, of uh, Battle of the Planets, or Gachaman in Japanese, an extraordinary story involving the uh, inimitable Sandy Frank um, producer who'd had a number of hits, including Lassie and Name That Tune, really knew American TV audiences, was also the one to first see Gachaman uh, being dis displayed at a French television, uh, uh, you know, uh, program fair, and the story of how he brought Gachaman to American TV, specifically to NBC mm -hmm. and then national affiliates, uh, is utterly fascinating because it involves, of course, the success of Star Wars, which enabled him to sell the program to his higher ups. It has space. It has rockets. It has space. It has, it has, it has battles. Yes, <laughs> exactly. And in fact, because of the very thing you cite, the need to mask the ambiguity, the need to mask the darker undercurrents in the, the death. original Japanese. People the die, death. And, they, and they don't really die-die mm. in the English version, the first No, English they version. don't at all. And in fact, uh, the characters are also, um, you know, they have many, many flaws, and they tried to sort of sand those away. In addition, they brought in a deus ex machina who is uh, based on R2-D2, and he's called Seven Zark Seven. I remember Seven yeah, Seven, like seven. seven and his, his principal job was to remind the kids that everything's okay and we'll go back to normal next week. Don't, don't you worry. <laughs> Have a glass of milk. It'll all be fine. One of the other things that I, I found fascinating was your discussion of one of the, the, the originator of, of Japanese animation and, of, and basically of manga at post-war, uh, Osama Tezuka, yeah. the Disney of Japan, the, the uh, ma manga god, and the things that he accomplished and yet the situation, some of his decisions placed most Japanese animation houses and anime artists and producers economically. Yeah. Because of his, uh, because of the way he approached bringing his product to, to Japanese television. Could you talk a little about that? Yeah, I mean, that, some 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 people who are less uh, sympathetic to uh, Tezuka would would use the term well, the term that we now use, which is dumping. Mm -hmm. Um, he essentially flooded Japanese TV with his work and sold it for the equivalent of approximately, what, uh, be work out to about $3,000 an episode. Yeah. Ludicrously low price. Uh, which, you know, the accusations against him are that he dumped this stuff out there because his competition then couldn't afford to compete, essentially. Um, and it's it's worth pointing out that that Tezuka was a was a relatively well off kid. I mean, the fact that he was able to watch Bambi uh, 80 times in the post-war period in a cinema, uh, 
meant that he had access to... And anybody who knows how much it costs to go to the cinema in Japan. Right, exactly. And in, in that period, people didn't have money. So exactly. uh, he came from a fairly well-off family. So there is some weight to that accusation, but the flip side to the story is that, that he felt he was on a mission to disseminate this great work and get it out there. And he felt like getting it on as many TV stations as possible meant it might get picked up by overseas television, which it did in the case of Tetsuan Adam or what we know as Astro Boy. So it's a, it's a dual-edged story, like so many stories in, in the anime and manga industries and the entire Japanese pop industry there. Two and ways and to look at. a theme that I found fascinating, too, you might, in, you might get the idea, I like this book a lot, <laughs> Delighted. was uh, your discussion mm. of the Japanese attitude toward intellectual property and mm. how it impacted the way anime and manga later entered this country uh, and also, you compare it to the comfort level the Japanese have with when it comes to making objects or creating objects for commerce, and uh, rather than the idea of creating ideas as a commercial entity. Mm. Can you can you go into that a little bit? Sure. Uh, there's a term in uh, in Japanese, um, monozukuri, which essentially translates as thing making. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's uh, with, with positive connotations, making things well. And as we know, over the past three to four decades, the Japanese have done a stellar job at making things well, which is one of the reasons why Toyota is about to overtake every other car company in the world. I own a Camry. You own a Camry. Uh, my mother and father own a Camry. I mean, it's, uh, they, they make things well. Mm -hmm. And uh, that goes back to the Sony Walkman when I was a teenager. Um, what has happened is that that... that ethos has become a, a, a bit of an obstacle when, uh, because of economic shifts, geopolitical shifts, the, the, the value now is on, on making uh, ideas well, <laughs> something incidentally that the Americans have excelled at. Um, but the Japanese creatively, especially in their storytelling, do a marvelous job too. They do a marvelous job of making the stories. The question is, are they able to create an investment structure I mean, here we get into the business side of the mm -hmm. book, the economics that I explore. Are they able to create an investment structure that can support uh, the creative industry, especially as it attracts global attention and as the technologies change? You know, CGI starts to cost money. And, and you also talk about a generational change that's occurring in the world of professional animation, especially... There was a phrase you used that I'd like to explore, the hollowing out yeah. of anime. What's mm -hmm. happening? A couple of key, key factors there. The infamously declining birth rate in Japan. Uh, I think it's down to 1.3 now or something. It's very, oh very low. For a developed nation, it's very, very low. Uh, the second thing is the generation gap in Japan, which is much more pronounced than it is in this country. Post-war? Pre-war? Uh, well, post-war. Post-war post post or what? Well, no, it's the, well, what we would call the boomers right. and their kids. Huge divide. I mean, it's very interesting to compare. In America, the boomers listen to hip-hop as their kids listen to hip-hop. Some of them, right? Yes. Not in Japan. There's a real gap. There's a gap in the way they speak. And the language has shifted, almost more like the way the hippies used terms in the 60s that their parents didn't use and didn't understand. So there's a huge generation gap, and those kids those talented uh, young graphic artists and so on, they don't want to go through an anime industry that will only give them an opportunity to cut free when they've been in it for 20 years, the hierarchical system. So if they're not making money, if they're eating uh, cup ramens at 11 o'clock at night, still at their desk, and they're not seeing the income accrue, They'll go into graphic arts. They'll go into web design. They'll go into game design. And that's part of, it actually, it's part of a death of the salaryman concept it in is. a large portion of Japan. That's right. It is. So it's, it's the, as with always with these stories, there are ironies built in. <clears throat> the uh, economic slump in Japan, which was not technically a recession throughout 10 years, it was a slump. Mm -hmm. But it actually opened up opportunities for young, talented Japanese creative types who would have before then gone into Dentsu, the great advertising agency, or gone to work for Toyota or Sony. Uh, 
Instead, they pierced their ears and went out into Harajuku or Shibuya and created things. Uh, and now you have graphic designs, you have exactly. fat, you have fashion, you have all these other things coming up and impacting the U.S. in terms of influencing design and the approach to presentation here in the U.S. You have Japanese DJs who command top dollar in New York and L.A. And you have second careers for Puffy Ami Yumi. That's second career. That's, <laughs> that's a mild way of putting it. After 10 years of being nowhere, they're, uh, they're in the Macy's Parade. It's amazing. It's amazing. We only have a couple more minutes. Can I, what do you see, you know, based upon what your observations of the trends, what do you think is the most promising thing that's going on right now in terms of the transfer back and forth of, 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 of cultural artifacts between our two countries? I think the most promising thing that's happening um, is the collaborative sensibility that's arising. On the Internet, it's American kids literally studying Japanese, learning at least katakana and hiragana, the basic mm -hmm. symbols, and trying to communicate with their Japanese counterparts in Japan. Um, it's Japanese uh, kids who are getting into uh, American uh, pop music and then using it in their anime films, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's also happening at a higher level, at a professional level, where you have Samuel L. Jackson producing a Japanese-made anime doing the voices. Um, you have the RZA from the Hip Hop's uh, Wu-Tang Clan doing the soundtrack. You have Tech on Concrete, this new film coming out of Japan, which is extraordinary. The director's American. All the artists are Japanese. The production studio is Japanese. The screenplay writer is American. I mean, it's, it, I use a, um, a metaphor in my book called the Mobius Strip, a 19th century mathematical idea that twisting and twisting and twisting, and you can't see which side is which. That's what's happening. It's happening faster now. Okay. We're almost out of time. Yep. You have a, another book coming out besides the one that's currently on the shelves. Can you tell us a little bit about it very quickly? Very quickly. It's a novel called Access. It involves uh, an internet cult, uh, a love triangle uh, between a half Japanese woman, uh, another a Japanese woman, and a guy who's Native American who's uh, serving at a base in Japan. And um, it's... Uh, it, I, I've always been fascinated by cults, and Japan's a great land of mystique and cultism. Sounds fascinating. We, something we can look forward to. What's the title? It's called Access. Access. Yes. Outstanding. Well, Roland Kelts, we have Japan America on bookshelves now. Uh, look in, your, uh, in the cultural studies sections of the bookstores here in the U.S. And Access, coming soon. Thank you very much for stopping by. It's thanks. been fascinating, and we've only touched the surface of the stuff in the book. I well, thanks thank for having so me. Much. It's been great.